Hello, and welcome to the Garden Organic Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown, Garden Organic's Growing Advice Editor, and I'm joined by Chris Collins, our Head of Horticulture. For the next 40 minutes, we'll be talking about organic growing, giving you tips and advice. This month, the lovely early summer month of June, we'll be talking about watering, keeping an eye on your summer crops, and reminding you how to make a homemade fertiliser from the plant Comfrey. Chris and I both get out and about. From food bank users in London to school children in Worcestershire, we discover some of the inspiring work which happens in garden organic projects. And finally, our listeners' post bag, which includes questions on problems with germination, how to deal with aphids, and advice on using those little worm-like creatures called nematodes. So we hope you enjoy listening, wherever you are. Okay, Chris, so it's June. How's June for you? June is a little bit. I'm like one step in, one step out a little bit in June. And I say that because at this moment in time, I have quite a lot of plants on the go. Some good running beans, some good cools yet. Even my bedding's just gone in. But it's not quite time to take the, pe- the foot off the pedal, I suppose, if you like. Um, if I get to the end of this month, I think I'm into happy days. I keep all those, health- those plants healthy. But it's still irrigation time. It's still keep an eye on it time. So I think a little bit, June still says jeopardy. But it also says over the rapids and into the calm of waters. It's kind of that halfway house a little bit. I thought May was good and busy, but June, it just keeps coming. But having said that, I love being in the garden in June because the flowering plants are absolutely coming into their own. The fragrance from the roses, the mm. honeysuckle, the syringa, it's a delight. I think for those um, temperate plants this year, shrubs, climbers, etc., it's been exceptional. And I think my educated guess on it is we had a very hot blast for a few weeks in the summer and the wood ripens. I saw this in Japan when I worked there. And so those plants, camellias early in the year, magnolias early in the syringas now, the honeysuckles, have really, really performed this year. So while you're worrying about your courgettes, there's always something nice to look at in between. Isn't there? And the evenings are so long because, of course, we're working up to the longest day. So there's no excuse not to put down the gardening tools, have a glass of wine. Exactly. In and that lovely so, so I think this is June for you then. A beautiful month. And we've just got a little bit more effort to do for the more intensive crops, the half-hardy annuals, your bedding, your, your veg. You just need to keep an eye on that for a few more weeks and you're kind of going to have an easier time and the, the benefits will be reaped shortly. I've just finished cutting my asparagus, but I think the potatoes, I'm going to be digging them up by the end of the month. I'm cropping as well. I'm having fresh lettuce, salad. I'm having rocket. Uh, my good lady at home loves a salad and so I'm in the good books because I'm bringing that in at the moment now and uh, potatoes are cracking on. I just want to see my beans put a foot on in the next couple of weeks and I'll be a happy man. So the important thing as always Chris and I know it's a subject that's close to your heart it's watering Yeah. and June can be very variable it can get very dry but it can also be very wet. Well, from London and I know we all don't live in London we can't, We get this is from far away it's been a nightmare for me this year I've, uh, this is the driest May I've seen in a long long time and I'm talking to the point where the ground's cracking etc that's not a massive issue you just got to water you just got to irrigate but that put pressures on your time etc but it has been a little bit under the cost this year and it just again comes back to what we said many times is attention to irrigation is like the foot soldier of the whole game if you like and um and i've had to get up an hour earlier before i've gone off to cornwall or whatever and water my plants because that's the challenge that i've been presented this spring so it has been a problem even though it's been quite cool temperature actually may Um, irrigation is definitely something you cannot ignore you need to keep an eye on it so let's talk a little bit about how you can maintain your soil moisture for your plants one of course is you're going to water water the soil and not the plant Mm. water deep and water long little dribbles won't help it won't help the plant provide a good deep root system And then I think finally, it's mulching. Now, we always talk about mulching, but as you know, this is putting down a layer of organic material, maybe your grass cuttings or something. That will protect the moisture within the soil and stop it dehydrating. Yeah, you want want to avoid the transpiration. So if you're going down there at 11 o'clock in the morning on a hot day or a warm day and watering a couple of cans onto your beans and leaving, you've not watered anything. Early in the morning, when it's cool, really, really good drink straight to the base of that plant. And while you're doing that, you're checking, is it looking healthy? Does it need a feed? You're doing all those other jobs. But really give it a soak early in the morning. And then what you can do is to stop that transpiring, to stop it um, being lost through the day, is put down your grass clippings or put down a mulch. Absolutely fundamental this time of year. So I have a little mantra which involves weeding, watering, yeah. mulching. Yes, yeah. And if you do that, those three things for each plant, I think you'll, be, you'll get through June okay. And also, you remember that some of it will also help with your P&D problems. So if you're doing courgettes, etc., which are pest and disease, 
Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to breathe out. I'm like I'm in the army, isn't it? My pest and disease problems, particularly funguses, botrytises, moulds, which uh, plants like courgettes might be vulnerable to, or herbaceous plants. If you're putting down mulches around it, then that'll help prevent those as well. And of course, you can still sell in June if things have failed, you know, and yeah. we all have problems with things that don't germinate. You haven't passed it. No, yeah. Well, technically, it's still spring, isn't it? To a certain degree, to a certain degree. Now, and things like courgette and runner beans and French beans are, are very fast-growing plants. In fact, a lot of people make the mistake of going too early with them, I'd say. I'm guilty of this myself. You, you kind of can get a bit impatient. You want to sow them in late March, whatever, and put them on propagators. I'm, actually, there's not so much of a rush as you think there I is. think that's a very good point, Chris. Mm-hmm. And also herbs, summer herbs, like... Basils and yeah, exactly. coriander's. Exactly. I've got a load of parsley on the go. Fresh parsley, yep. you can't beat that. Yeah. And something like rocket, if you sow it too early in the year, it'll bolt. Yes. So save your rocket sowing yeah. until later. And, so and also remember, you can the whole idea of the salad crops, particularly, is you can re-sow them. So you want to you want to get them rolling, basically. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Yes, it's no good having twenty lettuces all on the go and all maturing at the same time, and then you haven't got any. Exactly. The rest of the exactly. Time. So don't just because it's getting on in the season, don't think it's not time to indulge. That lovely, lovely pastime sowed seed sowing. And another thing I'm going to be doing in, is making another batch of comfrey tea. Yes, good old comfrey tea. Now, comfrey, we've talked about this, this <laughs> wonderful plant that you grow in your organic garden. And comfrey leaves will provide this perfect, perfect mix of nutrients for your plants. It's a natural fertiliser. And the way to use it best is to make a tea. This is not a tea you can drink, I hasten to add. <laughs> One listener did ask if she uh, could. Let's not try and poison people. Right? I think it's the smell would put you yeah, off more yeah. than anything else. But if you mash up the leaves in a bucket of water, cover them with water, leave it for a month or so, you will get a very strong smelling but very potent liquid fertiliser. So you would drain that off and then use that in a sprayer or in a watering can? I would drain it off straight into a watering can and then use it for all my particularly hungry plants like sweet peas, yeah. tomatoes, things that are growing in a confined space but need a lot of nutrients. Yeah, so and quite fast moving in terms of their growth, quite demanding, and they, they use supplement with that basically. Yes, and it, I've grown it for free. Yeah. And it, I've made it for free. I haven't yeah. had to go to the shop. It is a bit smelly much. though. It is <laughs> Just very smelly. It. I wouldn't get away with it on my balcony, I know that. So it is important to say that if it isn't your thing to smell it, you can buy it pre-made, can't you, and use that as a, as a, as a liquid feed in a watering can, in a sprayer. But the, the fact that it's just one of the best fertilisers, if not the best fertiliser you can buy or grow. I must say as well, it is just amazing for bees. Yes, that's very true. It's, it's, so if you're going to cut the leaves, if you're going to cut some... and it's Try and avoid the flower. Plant, mm. Exactly. Leave some plants, um, some flowers for the bees. Yeah. And finally, Chris, I'm going to be going over my strawberry bed. One of the pleasures of gardening is going down and cut, picking your own strawberries. Mm. So I will be making sure that the fruits are carefully just raised above the ground. People put straw I was going to say, do you straw down? If you can, mm. if you can get hold of straw. I'm lucky I keep hens, so I've always got a supply of straw. But if you put clean straw underneath the berries, then they won't rest on the ground and rot or get attacked by slugs. And make sure they're well netted because Mrs. Blackbird loves yep. my strawberries as Don't much as I do. And <laughs> make sure that netting is firmly pinned down so the bird can't get inside and get trapped. And do you think, I'm always a bit of a big believer, there's two things I think with strawberries, is that every now and again, obviously the first year specifically, but also further down the line, they like a good haircut. Yes. I like to really, really hit them in the winter and then I tend to get more crop off them. The other thing I think they respond to is a little bit of tommy feed, a little bit of tomato feed, a little bit of potassium. So a little bit of a, uh, potassium tommy feed in your watering can around this time might improve your fruit as well. And it's important to say to our listeners, you don't need a big area. I grow strawberries in a pot. I grow them in hanging baskets. I don't get millions of them, but I do get the odd bowl of them, and that's sometimes enough. So let's leave Chris enjoying his strawberries and move on to our interviews this month. Oh, and by the way, if June brings a host of weeds to your plot, you can always listen to our May podcast where Chris talks about weeds and some of the benefits they can bring. Now, let's hear more about Garden Organics' work. Our colleagues in the GO team not only provide help and support for individuals who want to grow organically, but we also work with schools, healthcare providers, neighbourhood and community groups. For some, it's an introduction to the organic principles. To others, it's helping them to realise their ambitions to grow in the most challenging of circumstances. 
Chris goes to inner city London to find out more, and I travel to rural Worcestershire. But first, I caught up with Sally Gardner, Garden Organics Head of Sustainable Communities. Sally, we know that organic growing is good for the environment and it encourages sustainable practices, but perhaps at its heart it's about supporting healthy communities. Tell me about some of the projects that Garden Organic is working on. Uh, Garden Organic are working on a range of projects at any one time. Um, I think we have about 25. They're all over the UK. We've got two primary projects, which are Master Gardener and Master Composter. Master Gardener and Master Composter. Tell me, what makes a Master Gardener? Uh, Master gardeners don't need to be an expert in gardening. They just need to know a little bit more than the person that they're supporting and mentoring. And their role uh, is to go out and spread the message of organic gardening, the health and well-being benefits to residents, to community gardens, to schools, to residential homes, migrant centres, anywhere really. Presumably sharing the techniques of organic growing. Exactly, yeah. And the wonderful Master Composters? Master Composters been around now for oh, almost 20 years. Again, is a volunteer-led scheme where we support volunteers to go out and take out the waste messages to their community, teaching people to compost for their organic garden, the benefits of using homemade compost. These composters actually work in conjunction with the waste management system within their local area, i.e. local councils. Indeed they do, yes. Most of our commissions come direct from the local authority waste department. We're all trying to streamline our waste bins and master composter is an important part of that. But we'll also give advice on general uh, using resources responsibly, which as you know is one of our key, key principles of organic gardening. Sally, later on we're going to hear from Debbie who's working on a particular project in Southwark, South London. Can you tell me about this project? Sure, the Southwark project um, came around three or four years ago now um, as an intervention to support people at risk of food insecurity in the borough. But by that you mean people who genuinely don't have enough money or means to buy food? Exactly, yes, that's right. So they could have been food bank users in the past or heading towards that food bank crisis point. Um, so it was about trying to empower those people. We all know that planting a lettuce seed now is going to feed them tomorrow but what it might do is empower them to feel like they've got some control over their future. Universal Credit uh, in Southwark uh, was one of the pilot areas and so that caused a lot of unsettlement. There was a big rise in food bank use uh, when that was introduced. So we, we are trying to bring people together through organic gardening, teach them how they can easily grow something fresh and nutritious to add to a package of processed food. Yes, of course, but it's very rare that you see fruit and veg there. We can teach them how they can still do that, whether they're in a high-rise and they can grow on a balcony. There's no barriers. Uh, Everyone can grow a little something. And as you say, it gives them a sense of control in their own lives when things might be spiralling out of control. Yeah, exactly right, yes. It sounds very special. Sally, you say that we've got projects across the UK. Give me an idea of where they are and what some of them are. The furthest north is in Cumbria. Uh, that's a master composter scheme and we go down as far as Kent with a growing buddy scheme down in Maidstone. Growing Buddies? Growing Buddies is funded by a housing association in Maidstone uh, to try and encourage their estate residents to take pride and look after new growing spaces. Oh, that's interesting. So it's actually creating a, or using a public area to grow vegetables and flowers and plants. Sure. So they are residents from the estates themselves, often with little or no horticultural knowledge of their own, but a desire to make their environment a nicer place to live, uh, discourage antisocial behaviour, have some produce at the end of it, get outside. So they work with a, co- a garden organic coordinator to learn about how to look after those spaces and then they encourage their neighbours and friends to get involved. So we've gone from Cumbria to Kent. You also have some, a project in Norfolk. We've got a couple of projects in Norfolk, yes. We've got a master composter project that's been going for, I think, about 13 years now. We've also got a master gardener project uh, to tackle social isolation. So this brings in the theme of the well-being of communities. Sure. And by getting together to plant, to grow, to eat, cook, 
all done organically yes. and all led by our wonderful volunteers. These really are remarkable people, don't you think? They are. We've currently got about 520 volunteers in our department and 17 staff, so yeah, it's a big operation. It is. Yeah, we couldn't do it without the volunteers, they're amazing. How do you become a volunteer? Uh, when we have a new project in a new area, we will appoint a garden organic coordinator to go in and manage that project. They're usually somebody locally pay- based who knows the lie of the land and has networks, and so we will undertake a recruitment drive for new volunteers, posters, flyers, parish meetings, radio, uh, to attract people in. For a master gardener, for example, they need to have a couple of years of organic horticultural knowledge. But the role is more about being able to engage with others. Not every gardener makes a master gardener, even if they've got 30 years of organic knowledge. If they're not the kind of person that wants to engage with others and share the passion, then they're not going to make a successful volunteer for so us. So it's about the sharing. Exactly. And it's also we being about... We can give about... them the horticultural skills and the knowledge, yes. um, which is the benefit of volunteering for Garden Organic. They get lots of support, training, resources to undertake their role, but we need natural communicators that are happy to go out and infuse other people. Sally, thank you very much for sharing Garden Organic's work in the community. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been a pleasure. So let's go straight to two of the projects that Sally was talking about. First we hear from Chris, who is in London looking out over a community garden in Hackney. Right, I'm here with a, a colleague of mine from Garden Organic who works in, uh, in North West London. Northwest and also South London. South London as well. So, of course, we're into Southwark as well. Yes, Debbie Mitchner, yeah. who I have a lot of pleasure working with him, is out on the ground. But I want to start, the first bit I want to start with is a state we're on. Tell us where we are, Debbie. So we're on the Wilson Estate, which is in the E8 postcode of Hackney. Um, it was built on a bomb site and it would have been Victorian housing, but is now a low rise um, housing block. Amazing. And I am particularly interested, as you know I would be, mm-hmm. about the gardens here. Because I know you've been very... Um, big part of how they've been developed. I'm just looking to look outside, you've got raised beds, you've got some uh, greenhouse, a polytunnel, there's a lot going on out there. Tell me how that all came about. I grew up on a market garden, mm. so I've had a long history of growing for myself and having access to an outside space at that time was really important to me. Um, the family situation was changing. Yeah. Um, my son has um, some disabilities, so for me to be able to go outside and have that space and grow was fantastic. So it was all about sort of trying to get connected back to nature and then encouraging other residents. I was going to to say that. So so this was a community thing. I I have dealt with you before when we did the Chelsea thing. You helped me out with the Chelsea flagship. And there was a real... um, mixture of people there from young there was a young mm. lad 13 14 to older lads to mm. there's a, so there's been quite a big collection of people involved in this isn't there there is especially over the years i mean there's been all sorts of people involved and and because it's a, a housing estate people do come and go so there has been a mix but we do we have so our youngest gardeners would be two yeah and our oldest would be in their late 70s early 80s so it's, you've got that whole breadth and also the different backgrounds so we've got people who have backgrounds turkish um, we've got Persian, Indian, obviously the Caribbean. So we have all the different influences of what people want to grow and can grow. Wow, that's fantastic. And that leads me nicely on to your work in Southwark, because I've worked with you on this, and I'll be very blunt with you here. One of my favourite parts of being part of GO has been the Southwark stuff. I've really enjoyed turning up and doing that. Mm-hmm. And you've created quite a, a family there, quite an atmosphere there. And mm-hmm. Tell me a bit more about that project. Well, Southwark was an interesting one because it was born out of the... Um, issue of food insecurity or food poverty. Southwark was a test borough for universal credit and uh, Garden Organic were forward thinking enough to be able to see that that would cause an issue with food and they wanted to link that into the Master Gardener programme to try and help people to be able to grow a bit of their own food, you know, sort of have that space to explore what they could grow that to supplement their diet. So it could mean anything from a, from a window box... Get out. This is the cat in the background, by the way. <laughs> it could be anything from the window. I feel guilty now. I've lobbed him off his box. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it could be anyone from the background who could be growing just maybe some pea shoots in a pot mm-hmm. right the way through to a community centre. Mm-hmm. And again, though, I mean, it's important to say this. 
you get a very a, a myriad of different kind of people there. So some with mental health issues, right mm-hmm. through to people who are quite competent, quite middle class. So you're dealing with quite a, a scale of people, I suppose, is the right word. Yes, yeah. I mean, we've dealt th- with things from like refugee projects where people have very little English, right the way through to people with, as you say, mental health issues, learning disabilities. Um, one of our most prolific volunteers has his own issues, but is out there and he's given over 600 hours to Amazing. the project in two years um so yes it's a quite a breadth and then as you say you know we, we've got people who are just coming along to certain community classes and they are from quite well to do backgrounds but we have worked on 24 housing estates across that's Island. a lot lar- really large amount isn't it mm-hmm. and so that uh, the Southwark project has made an impact i would argue hasn't it through your hard work mm-hmm. and the people involved in Southwark, they've made an impact haven't they they have yes yeah and we've also gone into some schools and helped support garden organics projects with schools in the borough um and it's had a massive impact i think we've we've managed to encourage people to grow pea shoots even though they haven't got <laughs> windowsills if anyone's wondering we've got a cat sat on some bubble wrap behind us so if you want to know what the noise is yeah okay it's brilliant we'll, we'll let what's the name of the cat the cat is india india thanks for your contribution my friend yeah. it's an amazing thing and i hope it continues and i hope garden organic um keep their interest going on it as well it's really important i'm kind of interested um you're very dedicated very caring person i'm kind of interested how you go out and do this for a day how you when you come home at the end of the day how you feel sometimes it must be stressful Mm. Sometimes you, it's quite hard work dealing with people and their, and their mm. myriad of personality. <laughs> How do you feel when you come home? What makes you tick, basically? Um, and keep going back to it. Yes, yeah. I suppose it, it, it's the fact that you can see the impact. Um, and I know from personal experience the impact that gardening's had on my own mental health. And I can see that, that same impact happening to people in Southwark. And also just having that sheer joy of watching people do something that they, they feel they have no ability to do. Yeah, yeah. I.e. to grow a plant. Lots and lots of people, when you ask them, do you, can you grow something, do you garden? They immediately say, no, 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 I kill everything. But it, it is so, as simple as pea shoots or sprouts on a window. And, it, and it's, a, it's a confidence thing, isn't it? Because... Mm. Because if you get one thing right, you then it kind of the, the floodgates open. Would you agree with that? Yes. Is that yeah. So you, you kind of do what if you just do pea shoots and suddenly, oh, hang on a minute, I'll sow some lettuce. Then you go, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to plant a forest. Yes. Kind of, that way. <laughs> it's interesting because I feel very similar about it. So you're, you, it's that. So the core of what you're saying is that mm-hmm. that connection with nature and garden is what kind of inspires you and leads you to the rest of it. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. It is, and it's it's having that link in. In an urban environment, so to be able to give people something on their their doorstep, I think is very very important. I kind of view it that that blinkers off effect mm. that um, people kind of we we're quite self absorbed, aren't we? And we've mm. got we've got a lot of things to deal with. Just staying afloat mm. in London is not yeah. the easiest thing, even for the even for people with the money and the privileges. Yeah. And sometimes it, it, just just to go to a park or to garden mm. kind of releases you from that pressure. Which is what I guess you're saying, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And gives you that space to think and breathe and just be. Be connected to being human again. Yes. So it comes to me to the final question, and I'll put you through the, the rimmer a little bit on this. Is is what about the future? What do you think about the future? Is it is it fund independent or? And also, what what do you think Garden Organics role might be in it? So the future of the Southwark project in particular is basically fund independent. I mean, it ha- it has plays such an important role there that I would love to see it carry on for another couple of years. I think projects like this to really embed themselves in a community need to be funded yeah. for five years yeah. um, because then we can step back and the community will keep it going themselves and um, Garden Organic would like to be in the position to help support, you know, keep that going. So, yes, it can put a bit of pressure on you. We, yeah. So it needs support, you need more support because yeah. you will put the hours in and you will do what yeah. you're passionate about so you, you will yeah. do that. I, well, I'm, You know what, Debbie... It's been really lovely to talk to you and I, I've really enjoyed our time so far. It's been excellent on Southwark and I will Thank always you. stand for you and mm-hmm. help you out where I can and I look forward to working with you mm-hmm. the next time in Southwark. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. From the urban delights of London, we moved to rural Worcestershire. I met Diana Sandercock to hear about her work as a master composter. Be warned, listeners, you may have enjoyed the scrunching of India the cat in his bubble wrap box, but you're now going to hear birds, aeroplanes and, of course, the fresh westerly wind. I have to say, it's all part of the joy of recording a podcast. Diana, you were a master composter for over 10 years. Tell me a bit more about life as a master composter. 
Um, basically, what we tended to do was, was obviously show, tell people how, how to compost, which meant going to schools, allotments, community gardens. We also did a lot of growing with uh, the university allotment, the students. So they were a regular feature, the things I did. Then we also, as a master composter, you then get involved in the Love Food, Hate Waste movement, which is all about food waste. And then, of course, that led to uh, cooking demonstrations, how to cook, how to make simple meals that weren't off the shelf. This was making the connection between cloth and plate. And also going outside and being part of the natural world. Tell me about Let's Waste Less. Which is not an easy let's waste. Words to say. Let's waste less. It was that for the want of a better name. <laughs> um, this is working in in Worcestershire. It's Worcestershire County Council. It's more or less the same emphasis. Worcestershire County Council is trying to get recycling rates up. They're trying to obviously composting is part of that because it you know it, it's less waste. So it's a whole range of things. It all it all links together really. And we've now started to do the cooking demonstration as well. Mainly since we've been on Let's Waste Less, it's been going out on stalls at green eco days and things like that. And you're just talking to members of the public. We did a lot in schools doing um, science uh, curriculum. Oh yes. And about change and decay and stuff like that. So you do a lot of presentations in schools. And a lot of enthusiasm from. The school kids. Oh yes, the kids are marvellous. I mean, they're brilliant. They don't worry about mini beasts, whereas the parents will go, "Ugh, you know, what's yeah. that?" Kids love them. I mean, they're being insects, in, worms, worms. anything. They'll touch anything, won't they? And 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 I mean, they're they're so enthusiastic. I think one of the best times I had was was seeing all these kids in one of the schools running around with pockets full of peas, which they <laughs> picked, <laughs> and then eating them. So yeah, it, it's just getting them used to to eating healthily as well. Because kids are brilliant because they they're so enthusiastic. In fact quite often when you're on stalls you find the kids know more about these things than their parents because they're getting that instruction but but there's the generations above them that had no instruction about cooking growing healthy eating and didn't even know where vegetables came from how do you reach people without knowledge i think one of the things i found really good was the um housing association community gardens these community gardens are springing up because they're, they're taking patches of ground and they're converting them into a garden. And it's bringing all members of the community who've probably never grown before uh, into this. So you've got a mix of ages and it's giving people a hobby they haven't had before. They're getting them outside, they're interacting and they're starting to learn these things, sometimes by trial and error and sometimes with the help of people like me. And they're finding, you know, they're finding something that they really enjoy. And enjoy eating the fruits of their labour. And enjoy eating the fruits of it, yeah. Have so there been it, any particular challenges? Um, well, on that particular garden, I do remember um, one of the children picking up a slug and wanted to take it home, and one of the ladies picked it up and stamped on it, and he cried, <laughs> he cried his eyes out. So we had to be a bit tactful about this. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it, it is difficult with children. You can't obviously... The, you don't really want to kill things. And that so, brings me on to how important organic is to you and to the project. Well, I think organic is absolutely essential now because, I mean, if you look at what's happening, certainly in farming, we've got you've got all this bacterial resistance to antibi- antibiotics now because of the fungicide use on farms. The uh, bacteria and fungi are becoming resistant to to. Uh, fungal treatments so you've got some serious problems out there and uh, I think I think really um, quite apart from the impoverishment of soils you've only got to see if you don't put humus into the soil the soil is impoverished so that's a bad state of affairs so I think, I think we're reaching a bit of a tipping point in this actually because if we don't do something about it we're losing our wildlife 10 to the dozen I mean we used to have 60 million hedgehogs so I mean now hedgehogs they reckon they're down to about half a million I think the whole thing is, is as I say reaching a bit of a tipping point you know it's getting to the point where something has to to change or else we're in danger of having serious problems. When you do grow organically, it's the quality of your soil that really strikes you. It's full of life. It's not just a dead bit of dirt, as some people call it. It is life. It's full of life. Microorganisms, the birds come down. the The whole ecosystem blossoms with organic gardening. And I think schools are doing a marvellous job now because they, they're, they're very keen on, on growing and, and compost and all this sort of thing. They do talk to the kids a lot and I think the kids are much more aware. 
Mm -hmm. Anna, that's really helpful. Thank you very yeah. much. It's been a privilege talking to you. Sorry. In these lovely <laughs> surroundings, that little Robin has been keeping us company. Yes. I hope you continue to enjoy your growing. Well, that's the lovely thing about growing. There's always a Robin around. And when you're growing, one will come right down to you and it'll be about a foot away from you. And it'll be asking you to give it something to eat. So you dig up something, it takes it away back to its, back to its um, nest. I mean, it's an absolute delight uh, interacting with nature like that. So now we're back in the office and it's time to open up the Garden Organic Post Bag. Joining us this month is Dr. Anton Rosenfeld, who's a member of the Garden Organic staff and a very knowledgeable person, particularly on pests and diseases. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, Anton. Um, Hannah, your first question. Yeah, so someone's written in and said they have a heated greenhouse, but this year have noticed that many of the seedlings either didn't germinate or they've been weak and rotted away. Can we suggest why? Chris, your thoughts? Well, that sounds like damping off to me. Sounds like a fungus that will attack the base of a seedling once it come, comes up. I think a lot of it comes from people who sow too thickly. So if the seedlings are too close together, you've got more chance of it. What it is, it's a fungus, but it specifically attacks the base of the plant. So if you've got a, a, a cotyledon stage seedling quite tight together and you just suddenly get this collapse of the seedling, and it, they really do sort of rot off at the base. And so you'll have a beautiful tray of thickly sown peas or lettuce or whatever, and you'll just see a collapse of the ceiling from the base. That, that, that is what I would call damping off. I think maybe the biggest problem here, though, if the greenhouse is still heated now in June, then it shouldn't be. It should be aerated. So lots of funguses will um, attack plants if they're in a humid situation where there's not air circulating. So I would imagine this is a damping off problem. The germination, not so sure about that. Anton, your thoughts? I think if there's a problem with germination... That could be a problem with scarred fly, particularly with things like the cucurbits. You've got um, courgettes and cucumber seeds, and also some of the larger beans like French beans. Um, sometimes when you take out your seed, you'll find that there's actually a mass of maggots there that are eating at the, at the shoots. And these are caused by the scarred fly larvae. They're the little flies which dance around on the top of your compost. You probably just see them as a nuisance, but actually the larvae, the young ones of these flies, are what cause all the damage. They eat away at the roots, plant so they can make your young seedlings grow very slowly, but also they can actually eat at the tip of the root just as it's coming out of the seed as well. So that can often be the reason why you don't see things germinate. Could you describe them to us? Are we talking about a big blue bottle type fly? The scarred flies are very small flies. They're probably only a couple of millimetres long. But I think the main thing about them is that they really do seem to dance around on the top of your compost. So it's not like the fruit fly that we see on top of the homemade compost in the compost heap? A fruit fly is something that drifts around, whereas a scarab fly is something that jumps around. It's quite interesting as well, is it, is it a problem for younger plants? As plants get older, is it less of a problem? Or is it at the seedling stage we need to be thinking about? It? It's mostly at the seedling stage. They will eat away at the roots of bigger plants as well, but they're more likely to be able to withstand it. I would also like to say it's nearly always just a problem of indoor plants, plants in the greenhouse. Things which are outside really don't seem to suffer from it. So it's temperature related? To a it's, it's, yeah. So what would your advice be, Anton, to this poor person who's clearly been attacked by scarred, or his plants have been attacked by scarred fly? There are lots of things you could do to prevent scarred fly. I'd say the very first thing to do is to make sure that your compost is fresh, and if you have used compost that's just slightly older, that you've sealed the bag up really, really thoroughly, because the flies can actually come and lay their eggs in the bag, so you've, you've actually started the problem before you've even so sown the So if you're using seed. last year's compost, for yeah. instance, you're keeping that to use again this year, if you haven't sealed it? I, I think you are very likely to have a scarred fly problem. It'd be better off perhaps using the old compost to fertilise your beds outside or something, really, not for seedlings. So fresh compost is quite essential, I would say in any seed form. We yeah. talked about damping off before. It's so a fresh compost at this particular important time yeah. when you've got babies on the go is quite important. And is there anything else you can do? There's quite a lot of other things you can do as well. I'd say using fresh seed is actually 
quite important as well. So if a seed is taking a long time to germinate, then that gives more chance for the scarab flies to, to come in. The other thing I've used, if I persistently have a problem with scarab fly in some things which are more difficult to germinate, I even go to the lengths of germinating the things on a bit of tissue paper first before before sowing them. Can you give me an example of which plants that might be? Um, some of the more unusual cucurbits, um, mm -hmm. I've found particularly things like loofah seedlings, they've got, they've got a very tough seed coat, but perhaps sometimes even courgettes and pumpkins, if you always get a problem with it, then just getting them going on a bit of tissue paper um, in a margarine tub will sort of help them get through that vulnerable stage. Tissue paper well dampened. Yeah, but not really sopping wet, just just moist, just moist, yeah, yeah. yeah. The third thing that I would do is to try and get things through the greenhouse as quickly as possible. So I would sow them and then as soon as they look like they're okay, I would put them outside for a bit during the day because it's so much less of a problem outside. And that's because of the temperature drop. Yeah. The, yeah. the fly or the larvae cannot cope with that drop in exactly, temperature. Exactly, yeah. Obviously you don't want to be putting things out on a frosty night, but certainly that's that slightly cooler temperatures outside is much less of a problem. So what we're talking about then is hard enough, basically, aren't we? That's what we're talking about, getting them used to a lower temperature, and that then reduces the scarify problem as well. Yeah, perhaps harden them off slightly more quickly than you would do normally right. if you have a scarified fly. Which problem. is always a terrifying process, as you say, because you put them out and you hope that they're going to be fine, and then you have to watch like a hawk the weather forecast for the dangers of an early frost or a late night frost. Or yeah, whatever. I'd still bring them inside at night, but it's those sort of warm daytime temperatures which encourage the scarab to fly. You need, you need to be around in the evening, is what we're saying, to bring them back in. Yeah. <laughs> the last thing I would say is not to overwater as well. Mm. That, that really does encourage the scarab to fly. I think we're damping off is the same. If there's too much moisture, you're more vulnerable to scarab. Fungus is like damping off. Uh, attention to watering is always a big detail, isn't it? Um, and one of the temptations is because the scarab flies attack the roots, you can see your plant starting to wilt slightly. And if they're wilting when they're already in a damp compost, then watering it is going to make the problem even worse. But that's a very good indicator, isn't it? A wilting plant, but in damp compost. Yeah, yeah. it's probably on its way out if it's got to that stage. I, you might have to end up sowing again. Some people debate as to whether you should wash your trays thoroughly between each year as well. That can. And the scarred fly is particular to a heated greenhouse. Would the same thing happen, for instance, if you used a heated propagator? Yes, they can, they can be a problem in those. I mean, they're quite often a problem of indoor house plants as well. It's having that sheltered to a warm environment. The last thing I'd also say about scarred flies about hygiene. Um, make sure that you don't leave bits of spilt compost around in the place and also little bits of sort of moss around in the greenhouse. Well they'll harbour them, won't it? This is what they'll, they'll just harbour them. They'll over, especially the fungus is going over winter in that for cooler times or whatever. Yeah, so it's very important. That's really useful because I think I'm probably like a lot of gardeners that if I have to buy compost in, use half the bag, stick the rest at the bottom of the shed and then come back to it next year. I think, I think it's quite it. important that if you're growing on plants at pot level, house plants, whatever, you, you probably get away with using older compost, but at seed level, seedling level, it's quite important. You want to give them the strongest start, I think. You're in a much better position if you give them that stronger start. It's the one area I wouldn't skimp on is what I'd say. Warmer the greenhouse, the more of a problem it is. Um, it's still a problem in an unheated greenhouse, but if you've got a greenhouse that's particularly if it's been heated over winter, then you will get a really bad problem. And of course that may be true for conservatories as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Right, on to the next one. Um, my roses are covered in green fly. What is the organic way of dealing with them? Oh, that's a good question because I've actually spent the past weekend squishing all my green fly by hand. Okay. <laughs> Any other suggestions? And the long winter nights. Yeah. It's always fun at your house. <laughs> of course, uh, birds and insects will also eat them. We know that tits, great tits in particular, will swoop down and feed a family on the aphids. And there are certain insects, like ladybirds, which will eat them. But there's no harm in yourself going around, particularly on roses I do it, rosebuds, because they have, if you're not careful, they have those long, etiolated stems before the bud, and that seems to me where the green fly actually gathers. Anton, how do you cope with your aphids? 
I wouldn't say there's one simple answer to aphids. It's a, like with most organic things, it's a multi-pronged approach. A good jet of water can, can be one way of getting rid of them. It's also important to remember that we do need low levels of aphids just to feed the birds and to keep our predator numbers up of all those sort of beneficial insects. And of the beneficial insects, um, I guess ladybirds get the most sort of glory and the most press because they're red and spotty and quite cute and easy to recognise, but there's plenty of other things as well. Hoverfly, would that help, would it? Or Hover, is hoverfly are brilliant, yeah. I mean, most people know what the adult hoverfly looks like, but they, actually the adult hoverfly is a vegetarian. It's, the, it's their little children which do all the, all the damage and hoovering up aphids. Um, the way to recognise an, a hoverfly larva is that it's little looks a bit like a little green caterpillar and some people might even squish it but actually we need to keep them there so if you see something that's about a couple of millimeters long and got a pointed head and is traveling pointed end first the chances are that it's a hoverfly larva and they go around hoovering up loads and loads of aphids the hoverflies are very clever because they lay their eggs where they know there's going to be lots of aphids because they want to make sure that their children have got enough food and to encourage hoverfly into your garden, there are a lot of flowering umbelliferae plants. Fennel particularly, I have a lot of wild fennel and that seem, they seem to love that. Yeah, anything in the carrot family. Just to get technical, hoverfly have got quite a short snout so they can only feed on shorter flowers. So things in the carrot family are particularly good. Coriander, once it bolts, don't, don't get rid of it. Mm. Leave it in your garden and you'll find there's a mass of hoverflies there. That's flat and easy for them to get into rather exactly. than something with a, not a daffodil with a long sort of tube on it or long yeah. petioles. And... There's a number of other things as well. Buckwheat is particularly good perhaps something you've not tried before but it flowers very very rapidly so it's good for getting hoverflies in quite quite early um, the sweet allison as well it's a sort of traditional rockery plant yeah, white flowers loads of white flowers yeah, yeah. So. Anton I like I really like the point you made about you need to have the pest to feed the predator so if you see aphids on your plants don't panic unless it's a really really bad infestation they're not actually going to kill it but that aphid will provide a source of food for the birds that you love in your garden yeah that goes well with sort of organic philosophy I mean there will always be pests and diseases at low levels it's just when it gets out of hand that it becomes a problem um, if you just obliterate everything you um, take provide, out the chain basically yeah you you leave a big blank slate for the pet and the pests will proliferate a lot more quickly than the predators if you if you just go in with a pesticide and obliterate everything that's a very good point there is an interdependency isn't there between all the wildlife in your garden that's very true yeah traditionally you'd have gone years ago soapy water that would have been your non-pesticide but that knocks everything out so you, you don't want to put yourself into that situation it's a bit of a balance because the sort of soft soap sprays that tend to have slightly more action on the softer bodied insects, right. um, particularly, particularly the, that's the aphids where they have less action on beetles and, and predators, but you have to get that balance right. Mm. So I, I would actually recommend using one of the sort of commercial right. products that's available because that has been formulated to, to, get that balance. to get that balance, whereas sticking washing up liquid on things, can it can also strip the wax off your plant leaves as well, which is something you don't want to do. Of course, a lot of people encounter blackfly on their broad bean plants because they tend to cluster at the top and round the flowers. One of the ways of doing that is to pinch out the top of the plant, isn't it? To get rid of it completely. Yeah, aphids tend to congregate around the tips of things because there is more nutrients and nitrogen particularly at the tips of plants and that's why aphids go there because they get a more sort of concentrated meal by sucking around there um, so yeah pinching out the tips once they've got tall enough is something you can do and you, it's quite nice to eat the tips yeah if you wash them off wipe yeah. that in a salad very nice Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So on to our last question. Um, so someone's written in and said, I've read about nematodes as a natural way of controlling pests. Do you think they are a good thing and can you recommend any? Okay, so first I ought to say what a nematode is. A nematode is a microscopic worm that lives in the soil. I think it's over a million species of nematodes. They're really the unsung heroes in the plant world. And like witches, there are bad nematodes and good nematodes. <laughs> Some will attack your plants, like the potato cyst nematode, but there are plenty of other nematodes which are really good at controlling pests. Most likely you're going to apply for nematodes online, 
because they're alive products, they have to be manufactured and sent out to order. So you can't buy them from a garden centre, for instance? A few garden centres do stock them, but they're less likely to have them. You do need to use them pretty quickly. You can keep them in the fridge for up to two weeks, but it's best to use them as quickly as possible. You will get them in a pack that looks a little bit like peanut butter. It's quite a sort of sludgy substance because they need to be kept moist to keep them alive. And you need to mix the contents in a watering can. And it's very important that you mix them very well. You also need to make sure that you use a rose which isn't too fine. Otherwise that will be trapping all your nematodes in the rose and none will actually get onto the soil. It's also important the conditions under which you apply them. The soil needs to be above five degrees otherwise that's just far too cold for the nematodes and they will die out and you need to make sure that you keep the soil moist for at least a couple of weeks. The nematodes live actually in the soil moisture so it's very important to keep that those moisture levels up. Presumably these instructions come with the nematodes when you've sent off or... They do, yes, So, but you do need to make sure you follow them, otherwise you really are wasting your money. And when you say wasting your money, they are actually quite expensive, aren't they? Yes, they are. It'll cost you about £12 to treat an area of 40 metres squared. But if you compare that to the cost of, say, some organic slug pellets, or even removing them by hand, as Chris does with his tongs, then they are quite pricey, aren't they? They are pricey. What they do is they actually get into the soil and treat the slugs which are living below the surface, which the slug keel pellets slug, for don't. instance. Yep, the sl- keel slug is one that um, lives under the ground, particularly and attacks potatoes, so you'll notice holes in your potatoes. So they also attack, attack strawberries quite a lot as well. All slugs will live under the ground, especially when conditions are slightly drier. They, they, they will revert to the underground levels where it's a bit more moist. You personally, I think, would use them for vine weevils. Yes, because they're so expensive, I would tend to only use these treatments for prized plants that you really don't want to lose. Vine weevils are particularly a problem in pots. They tend to lurk as grubs. You'll see them there in early spring or in late autumn, and it's the grubs that do all the damage. They are like a maggot shape, about sort of one to two centimetres long. When you pick them up, they tend to curl up. And what they do is they just destroy the roots of your plants. Which is quite devastating. It is. The adults, you'll notice, are sort of beetles, um, which are about a centimetre long with a pointed snout. Those don't actually do very much damage. It's the young ones, the the larvae, the grubs, which damage the roots. Ah, It's like the aphids, isn't it? It is. It's these young ones that are causing all the problems. (laughs) It is. So it's quite important the stage which you treat your pots with nematodes for vine weevil. It will only be effective in the early spring or in the autumn. Okay, so to sum up on the question that, that was sent to us, it seems that they are effective. They're a good organic practice. They're not using a toxic chemical. However, they are expensive and you do have to be very careful how and when you use them. That's true. Like most biological controls, they are just um, adding to what is already in the soil at small levels anyway. These nematodes are naturally occurring in the soil. That's how they discovered that they were effective, but you are just boosting their population. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Hannah? That that does. That's really useful. Thank you. That's brilliant. I love how I've got absorbed. Sadly, we've run out of time. Chris and I hope that your June growing is fruitful, but above all, enjoyable. And if you want to know more about Garden Organic, just visit our website, gardenorganic.org.uk. You can support our work by becoming a member. It costs less than £3 a month. And if you do that, we can provide you with a personalised help and advice service on all your organic growing queries. Next month, we tackle the interesting topic of how to adapt your organic growing to climate change. We hope you can join us. Until then, goodbye and happy organic gardening. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.